Hello, and thank you for joining us for the next session of the Destination IP Virtual Summit. In this session, a panel will discuss the evolution and benefits of law firm automation. A recording of the webinar and the slides will be made available to all registrants. Feel free to enter any questions using the Q and A feature in the Zoom menu. Also, feel free to follow us on LinkedIn to see news about other upcoming webinars. And with that, I'll turn things over to Steve. Hey, thanks, Michelle, and welcome everybody to the uh, webinar today. Uh, today we're uh, discussing law firm automation, um, and we've got a great panel. Um, we start out with Ann McCracken, who is uh, president of Black Hills IP. Ann has been practicing uh, and working in the industry for a number of years um, and is a prosecution specialist. She teaches at, at uh, what used to be called, Fran what do they call Franklin Pierce these days, and uh, New Hampshire School of Law? Yes, yeah, so, University of New Hampshire School, or University of New Hampshire Franklin Pierce School of Law. Yes, that's a, that's a mouthful. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Ann, I think you just completed doing a, a, some training with some of the students there last week. But Ann uh, brings a wealth of, of knowledge with uh, IP automation and uh, law firm automation and corporate automation. Tom Marlowe is also with us. Tom's also at Black Hills IP um, and he's the president of the renewals there. Um, Tom also uh, runs the technology team at Black Hills IP uh, and Tom is, is uh, lives, eat, eats and breathes law firm automation. <clears throat> We're looking forward to hearing from him today. Thanks for joining Tom. Peter Ribafoni, who is our legal process manager at, at Schweigman, and Peter has been working with Schweigman automation tools and processes uh, ever since he started at the firm, which is probably going on 15 years ago now. And Scott Os Otto, also of Schweigman uh, origin, and Scott uh, also has been working side by side with Peter. Scott's an application support specialist in our automation team at the firm. And so we're gonna hear from everybody today. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so kind of just an overview, we're going to have uh, Peter just kind of do a brief history, uh, partially for our amusement, um, of what things used to be like, um, and, and what sort of, you know, how we got to where we are. And then Tom and, and I are going to talk a little bit about the big picture of automation, you know, what are the big systems that everybody has uh, in their in their ecosystem, and a little bit about how those are connected together or, or, or mainly not connected in most cases. And then uh, Scott Otto is gonna go into the, you know, what I call nuts and bolts, talk a lot about the specific automation processes that um, Schweigman has and, and how they hook up and some of the features of those systems. And then we're gonna kind of finish up with a little future looking segment with Ann and Tom. So with that, we'll kind of get, kicked, get this thing kicked off so I'm going to turn it over to, to Peter, and Peter's going to kind of go through the little bit of history. Thanks, Steve. Um, so I've been uh, around long enough to remember back when um, we had actual file rooms and, and trifold folders sort of dictating our lives. Um, and kind of talk about how we got from that paradigm to what we're seeing today. Um, next slide, Michelle. So... Um, Back in the good old days, up until maybe even mid 2000s, um, a lot of our processes were driven by uh, the location of a file or a prior art file. Um, and the process was largely driven by getting access to that file so you could do your piece in the, um, in the workflow. So the, uh, the, obviously the, the, the biggest problem there was uh, people would have parallel files um, and working files, and oftentimes you are um, hindered by um, somebody else's delays. Uh, next, next slide, Michelle, please. So um, up until uh, we moved away from that paradigm, the, the biggest innovations that we saw that actually sped things up, and they weren't many, um, you know, uh, shifting to dictation and transcription to uh, faster creation of documents, um, you know, introduction of uh, electronic typewriters and later word processors, 
uh, to create documents in a standard format. Um, I know when at Schwegman, when we, uh, you know, innovated, and I put quotes around that, the printed file labels to uh, uh, what had been a manual process of updating the files with, you know, say the notice of allowance date and, um, and the whole file history on the cover of the folder. Um, in addition to that, we had a scanning and check-in system with a barcode that, um, and with a, a battery uh, scanner that we could go around the file, uh, around the firm and try to locate um, uh, missing files. And then, you know, if you had a database, it was probably a um, uh, standalone database, uh, probably just for docketing, probably managed just by the docketing folks so they could produce reports and go around and rattle cages and make sure everyone knows what dates uh, are out there and need to be handled. And then, um, you know, back before electronic filing option, fax filing was the, the nearest we had to an innovation, which compared to paper filing was an improvement, but, um, and, and exists some places still, but still was not a wonderful way to go about uh, innovating. Uh, next slide, Michelle. So the pros of uh, the old, the old uh, file-driven workflow is, you know, it was nice where everything was contained in a single file. Um, you would have maybe a, a prior art file or two, a uh, single trifold folder that contained correspondence, uh, client correspondence disclosure materials, uh, and, and references that were cited. Um, obviously the cons were what we talked about, you know, you oftentimes needed the file to do your piece or you had to produce a parallel working file. Um, there weren't very many opportunities to streamline the process. And um, I, all of us on this call are familiar with, uh, if you've been around for a while, uh, the all firm uh, emails panicked looking for a file that we needed to locate um, important documents. Uh, next slide, please. So starting in, in the mid 2000s, you know, we shifted to a, a database driven system. If you were like us and shifted to um, electronic files, uh, all of a sudden you could do a lot of things you couldn't do before. Uh, the process wasn't driven by getting access. Everyone could get access uh, at the same time. And people could work in parallel where you are um, able to access what your peers are, are looking at at the same time. Uh, additionally, you can feed that database much more effectively using data, APIs, et cetera, to give um, people you know, up to the minute uh, documents and, and updates to the file that you couldn't in a, a physical file uh, workflow. And then finally, you can uh, give your client access to uh, the files that you are also looking at. So the pros, uh, next, next slide please, Michelle. Um, so obviously some of the pros there or um, some of the features that automation enabled were scraping of data um, and populating databases. Uh, report creation, which we've all uh, been in day by reports, but they've helped make our lives simpler and, and dictate different separate workflows. Um, integration of multiple um, pieces of the workflow, you know, as opposed to a standalone docketing system, you know, now what we have is a case management system where you can have docketing, um, you know, uh, copies of documents, uh, email correspondence, um, as well as billing, et cetera. And then one of the bigger automation uh, advances is obviously the electronic filing with the patent office and other patent offices that enables us to um, pull things out of our database uh, and you know, file with different systems very effectively. So next slide. So pros would be multiple simultaneous workflows uh, no waiting for a physical file. Um, in fact, you can start cutting uh, pieces of uh, the workflow out as you automate those. Uh, for instance, you know, maybe not every person needs the, to be working on the file if you can create documents uh, in your database um, without manual labor. Um, the speed of updating, uh, multiple sources of data being pulled into a single database and 
be able to use that for in multiple ways. Um, and then be able to export information um, either to clients or across platforms. And then the big con, and this is a con that we'll never get away unless uh, AI gives us something here, is that that smell of those trifold folders um, it was wonderful. I, I, I can almost sense being back in a file room and, and smelling hundreds of brand new prior art binders uh, ready for, for uh, inclusion into our workflow. Peter, we're, we're working on this one at Black Hills. So <laughs> it, hopefully by the end of the year. It, it may be a smell that has been uh, protected, but uh, it's, it's one we should all be sharing. <laughs> that seems like an open source uh, item. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it over or turn it back to um, sure. Steve to introduce the next portion. Hey, thanks, Peter. So Peter, when you're talking about trifold uh, files and the smell, it, it made me flash back to the patent office uh, of old with all of the shoes and stacks of patents that we used to search through manually back in the day. And uh, they might smell pretty good at first, but after like 30 years of sitting in the patent office, they don't, you know, it, it, the, the, the bloom goes off the rose. So uh, I have to tell you, they don't smell so good about 30 years later. So anyways, <clears throat> we're gonna talk now about the big, the big pieces. And so we can go to the next slide. Um, we got an overview. And before Tom kind of goes into this a little bit, you know, I think the really big picture of law firm automation and IP and specifically, as you can think of um, that it's, it's been like uh, we have a brain, we've got all this computing power that's been around for a long time. And now we've got, you know, more computing power than you could even imagine using for virtually free almost. Here's the problem is that we have this huge brain, but the brain has no eyes, it has no ears, it has no sense of smell, it can't get any information into it to compute. And that's kind of where we sit uh, or have sat, it's gotten better lately uh, for a long time. The only way to get information into this computing system was through people's fingers largely as they transferred data from the PTO system into their own local docketing system or other system or from other places to other places. And so you cannot uh, make intelligent decisions if you can't see, can't hear, can't smell, can't taste. You know, you, you ha if you're trying to navigate in, in this data. So what's happening now is really the data is getting a lot richer and a lot more available to the brains. And so now we can get access to that data instantaneously. But for example, you know, it's still difficult to get instantaneous access to data from other patent offices around the world. And even the USPTO, which has done a good job, um, occasionally changes things and, and kind of breaks things a little bit um, if you're not ready for it. And they do a good job of warning you, but it all, everything's dependent on getting that information in a very timely fashion. So having said that, we're gonna talk about that in, in general, Tom's gonna kick into that now. So go ahead, Tom. Sure, thanks. Yeah, it's, you've got this issue of kind of these, uh, this data that is sometimes available um, in various forms in multiple kind of disparate places. Uh, you might call them these islands of data because you might have data with the patent offices, Steve, like you mentioned. Uh, sitting out there, docketing communication, bibliographic information. And then in another place, you've got nicely organized data sitting in a docketing system. Those things don't quite match up exactly all the time. Sometimes you have then another set of data sitting in a document management system, sometimes data in a, in a CRM, uh, data that comes in maybe even just by email right, from foreign associates or data that's in uh, business systems around uh, product line revenue and that type of thing that might be useful to bring together. And the, the big challenge then that you have in trying to put automation behind workflows 
and can, is really connecting these islands. Uh, but I, I think even bigger than just connecting them um, is um, being able to make them, I guess, kind of understand uh, what's coming from uh, one place or the other. And to Steve's analogy, I suppose that's like, you've got a brain that's trying to do the processing, but it's got to figure out how it's exactly sensing the data that's coming in. Typically, there's some sort of uh, reformatting or massaging or some other operation that has to be applied to data from one source before it can be ingested or used by by another system. And, and you know, sometimes it's not even necessarily about making these systems talk to each other, but about syncing the data up so that you can get a cohesive report or, or dashboard or so they can drive some sort of workflow um, to get useful automation out of it. Now, if, uh, come to think of it, if, if, you, uh, if you're looking at what good automation takes to work, um, you need to have a repeatable process, right? And then you need uh, data to be processed and data that's triggering the process. So sometimes all of these come from one source, uh, so they're all in a consistent format and it's pretty straightforward. But a lot of times, and especially if you wanna get a little bit more comprehensive, this data has to come from multiple sources. And uh, either for the, the triggering or for the actual automation that you're trying to run. And a lot of times then some sort of logic is needed to determine, say, like if, if that trigger is pre present. Um, an example here might be, like, uh, I guess a simple example might be a foreign agent requesting an instruction. So what is the instruction and when is it due? Then further logic, logic processes that data um, to put a reminder on a docket with the appropriate deadline. Then additional workflow may pull a pre-populated uh, response template using data from say a prosecution file, maybe client instruction configurations. So from multiple different sources, this has to be pulled together. Um, and then maybe we even take a look at family prosecution data that's analyzed or claim comparisons. So you can see how this, this uh, data may have to come from multiple different sources. And when you're pulling from these different sources, it can be a uh, complicated effort to get them to sync up correctly. Um, and so that's really at the heart of connecting these, uh, these data islands. But let's maybe take a look at some more of the details on the next slide here. Yeah, so this goes into a little bit of uh, the current systems and connectivity that, uh, that we're looking at today, right? We've got uh, PTOs with uh, data that really drives the prosecution process and then these IP management systems sitting kind of independently and the connections between them, which seem like the most straightforward are a lot of times not super straightforward. In fact, usually uh, I, I would say by and large take humans in the middle somewhere to make sure that that data from the PTO gets into an IP management system. In fact, I, I would say, um, uh, there's probably very few systems that can um, across the board take something, take everything that comes in from a patent office and make sure that it's automatically synced to an IP management system. Um, and then on top of that, you've got IP management systems with the ability to talk to each other. Um, uh, so, uh, just the way that they communicate the names of certain fields, um, meetings. So let's say you're pulling data out of one system and populating it into another, having ways of ensuring that the uh, filing date field from one system uh, is what the other system is expecting as a filing date and not a 
effective filing date or local filing date or international filing date um, as an example. Um, and then, of course, you've got uh, proprietary automation software that might be sitting uh, outside of these systems that need a way to talk and ingest that data. And then the document management systems. So when a communication comes out from the patent office um, uh, that's got a document attached to it, office action, notice of allowance, that type of thing, how do you get it properly filed into a DMS so that it can be found later. So I just inter interject a little bit here, Tom, on this and, mm -hmm. and say there's been a, uh, the, the, the level of automation now achievable and that I know you guys at Black Hills IP have done um, to convert, you know, USPTO raw data into actual docketing uh, decisions and, and cr select the correct templates and make sure everything gets pushed into the system correctly and gets verified. It's now possible to do that, but there's very few systems that do that. And in fact, a lot of, a lot of uh, people say, well, we've got automated docketing, but all they really do is the most primitive uh, display of things from the PTO and maybe tell you, uh, you might use this option to docket it or you might not, but all of them require people to push them through, except for Black Hills on the US side. And I know doing some of the foreign stuff, so a little plug for that. But there's a huge tension always in this that's between the human uh, factor and the, and the automation factor. And a lot of the tension is because humans can change on a dime uh, any process that they're working on. You can walk down to your docketing department at three o'clock in the afternoon and say, hey, I want to do this docketing thing differently. And at 3.15, they can start implementing the new change. Can't do that with, with automation is, is not like that. You know, you, you, you can probably configure a lot of stuff in the day, but you're not gonna get somebody to change the process like instantaneously. Humans are tremendously capable of doing all kinds of stuff with very little instruction and it works. And when you try to translate it, that into automation, it's extremely difficult because humans are really smart. And you know, on the other hand, um, all these rule dri driven things can be automated. It's just that you have to work through all the details and the devil is in the details of these automation uh, systems because you, there's so many pieces of information that humans have when they're working in these environments that you don't realize they're using to make decisions until you need to make the decision. And then you realize, oh my God, I don't even have that data. How do I get that data? Well, how am I gonna get that data? And just a quick example before we move on, because we need to get this thing rolling, but it's like we were trying to automate um, calculation of the uh, patent term extent, not patent term extension, which is easier, but actually uh, terminal disclaimers. You know, you get these families of cases and you'd like to know, okay, so if I put a terminal disclaimer in, how is that going to affect this term of this patent? Because there's multiple other patents in the family sometimes have disclaimers too. And, and just getting that data turns out to be not easy. You can't get it straight out of the PTO's database. You have to get their data. You have to OCR the other data off of other documents because it's not in the PTO's you know, normalized data set. So that's just an example of data you can't even get. You've got, you're blind. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And I, that, I like that one particularly uh, because like you said, it's not fielded data. You've got to go find a terminal disclaimer, possibly on a family member uh, within, um, within a PDF file, then has to be OCR'd if you want to be able to kind of automatically pull a date out of it. It gets complicated. And that's, this is the world that uh, Ann and I live in, uh, kind of defining areas where, uh, where automation is possible, but then lots of times specking it out, making sure that we've got the data to do it before it can actually be implemented. Let's get to the next slide. So I, you know, Tom, I'll, I'll, I'll sure. do the next couple. So, I mean, there's a lot of data flow friction right now in the practice of, you know, patent practice, probably other practices. And I mean by that is, is a lot of the data has to be manually transferred still. I mean, it can be automated, it's getting automated, but 
Um, you've got, if you're a law firm, you have dozens and dozens of clients that are sending you uh, various different instruction letters and documents and, and disclosures. And, and it, some of it comes in in a normalized fashion. Um, a lot of it just comes in in emails with attachments and trying to capture that data out of an email and attachment and figure out what all the data is and place it into your own database is, is difficult to, to automate, can be done. And we're doing that on a regular basis, but it's, it, it takes a lot of time. And then they change it on the other end. So that all these things where you have people sitting around transferring data, that's really a waste of time. It's a waste of, 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 of resources, but uh, we haven't figured out a, uh, a better way to do it yet, uh, although we're getting closer. So I, I, that's the data flow friction and it goes the other direction. And then of course, all the corporations, want to get rid of all of these manually intensive data operations out of their operation because they are uh, costly and they also require staffing and staffing requires management and all that other stuff. So they're pushing them all out to the law firms. And so the law firm is trying to automate, but they keep getting more things from the law, from the, their clients to figure out to do manually, which is, you know, we, we love having these challenges. Um, but we're basically the dumping ground for all manual processes now. And so we've got to work really hard to automate our side. Next slide. You know, and Steve, if you think about the, the folks that are handling uh, those communications that are coming in from across the world in various formats who have to read them, figure out what they're saying, figure out what needs to be docketed, uh, that's complicated work. So, you know, these are really smart people that are uh, doing this docketing type of work. And you're essentially having them read through emails and put things into docketing systems when if you could automate some of those tasks, then you've got these really smart resources that you can start putting on configuring automation systems or other uh, much more higher value add work around the firm. Yeah, so this just, thank you, Tom. And I think that's absolutely correct. This slide is really just saying, when you're, if you're a corporate uh, entity and you're buying a, a, a platform to work with your law firms, make sure that it's got a good API if you, um, so that your law firms can connect to it if they, if they want to. Uh, make sure their policy is open API so that they're, you know, your vendor of your software IP management isn't trying to trap you in their ecosystem of outsourced labor that you know, is never gonna get us to the automation future, but rather you know, hang on desperately to their you know, labor. So I mean, I think you gotta really be thinking, okay, what are the contract limitations that I'm looking at here when I sign an agreement to make sure that I'm not locking myself into somebody else's proprietary. And there's so many islands in this industry right now. Um, and one of the issues there is that a lot of these systems have been built up um, around, you know, sort of like capturing renewal business. And that kind of generates a certain development path, um, which has been normal in the industry. I'm not criticizing that because that's, that's how we've subsidized a lot of software development. Um, not Black Hills, I know, doesn't do that because they don't have that kind of revenue stream. But it's uh, <laughs> that most everybody else has a little piece of that anyway. So, anyways, look out for that. Next slide, we got to really get rolling for Scott here. But last plug, I want to give a big shout out to CPI Computer Packages. They've got a great API. CPA Global with FIP and other systems have great APIs, and they they make these things open even to their frenemies. Um, and AppCall and Patrick's are fantastic. Um, if, you're, if your vendor isn't on this list, you, you should ask yourself, what's going on with my vendor? Why, why are they not on this list? Um, and what are they doing that they shouldn't be doing so they're not on this list? So what's the next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so anyways, middleware is the key to getting all this stuff connected. We got to roll on and, and Tom will talk about that, you know, a little bit later on as we finish sure. up. We should roll on to get, get Scott going here. Um, so Scott Otto is the guy that's actually working in the nuts and bolts, not theorizing like Tom and I just did. So Scott, why don't you roll and 
talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts at Schweigman. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, I've been at Schweigman for about 22 years, and I've been in this position for about 15 years. Uh, I'm an application support specialist. I work with a team of, there's four of us, uh, one developer, two application support specialists, and one database automation administrator. And the systems that are used in most of our automation, um, Foundation IP is a key one. It's our virtual file room, it's our docket management system, it's our billing entry point, uh, it's our contact management system, it's uh, where we store file documents. Um, we also have the accounting system. Um, we've recently started to leverage Microsoft Teams, SharePoint, and OneDrive. And fortunately, we went live with those on February 3rd before um, people had to start working from home. And that has actually been a, a huge um, implementation for us. And then we have an in-house um, piece of software called Sidebar <clears throat> that's kind of like a Swiss army knife. It's, it helps us with merges from some of these systems. That we view some of the accounting data through there. We process the billing through there and we do advanced reporting from there. So those are the key components to most of our automation at the firm. Um, why do we automate? Um, we're saving time, we're creating efficiencies. Um, we are mostly doing, I'd say most of our requests are mass or bulk database updates. Um, clients might give us a uh, um, personnel change or um, they might have assigned a portfolio name to a number of matters and we don't want a person going from matter to matter trying to update data. So we have these mass or bulk database updates often. Um, and when it comes to client specific data, um, sometimes they'll ask us to track different dates than maybe a patent and trademark office would so that they can get their draft response four weeks after an action comes in. Or like I said earlier, they, they may have a portfolio that um, they need to have reports run against. And then um, for that kind of situation, we've had to create custom fields in Foundation IP to track those portfolio names. Um, internal workflows are a huge, a huge time saver for, um, or a opportunity for automation. And, and then simple things like report scheduling. Um, that is, you know, to send out a docket to everybody that works at the firm once a month would be an undertaking. And in Foundation IP, we use a report set and it uses two reports, one for the personnel, one for the information that they need, and it's all in a schedule. So leveraging the tools that we have already without reinventing the wheel is also kind of a key element to how we operate. We hopefully will reduce stress um, for people, um, myself included, and we're trying to allow people to concentrate on other more important tasks. And we're also trying to guarantee accuracy across these systems. So we want to rely on one version of the truth wherever possible. Most of our data actually flows from Foundation IP to be able to match the data in the accounting system, for example. Um, next slide, please. How do we handle automation at the firm? Uh, anybody, and I really mean anybody, can suggest something to be automated. They have some pain point that we need to try to help them solve. But we have to ask a few questions first. First of all, is it a, tr a training issue? Is this something that maybe they just don't know how they're supposed to do this and it's not really an automation task? Or are they using the proper tools? Or can we leverage or customize an existing tool? And if we get past that and we look at developing something, uh, the de development must be cost effective are we saving time? And is it for one person or is it for 100 people? Um, are we ensuring accuracy? Are we eliminating things falling through the cracks? Can the thing that we're trying to solve or develop, can it be maintained and broadened? Or are we relying on some software that we have today that we might not have tomorrow and we might have a different version of it uh, from an, another source? And again, maybe we reduce stress. <clears throat> um, the challenges that we run into when we start delving into these projects, we have to keep the solution simple at first. 
I mean, we can build a mountain out of ideas. Ideas come in all the time, um, new variants of, you know, well, we could do this or we could do that. Um, but what we, what we need to focus on is the minimum viable product. What is something that we can give you today that will help you with your job? And what can we build from that? We need to target the present with the flexibility for the future. And another challenge, um, enforcing or integrating a workflow for one group while honoring a flexible workflow for another group in the same process is a challenge. For example, our case management group is a very um, specific task-driven unit of people. And attorneys are actually given the freedom to work however they are efficient. And if we need to help both groups communicate or work together on something, we actually need to kind of develop something that keeps the case management group in their you know, area of expertise and, and in their comfort zone, um, doing process by process and let the attorneys be flexible with theirs. And then again, do we already have tools that can, we can leverage to get us to our goal? Those are the main things we have to think about. Next slide, please. Um, here's an example of something that is pretty complex uh, for our automation. And this workflow and automation is for our attorneys, and that's why they have a little smiley face by them. <clears throat> so a task is docketed in the docketing system, and I, I don't really care how that happens, um, but that's the starting point for this process. The task is docketed in the docking system with the necessary documents. Uh, we have a process that checks daily for new items or updates uh, to existing items that were docketed. And <clears throat> uh, looking for dates or document changes, the task is created or updated in the attorney's outlook tasks with links to a specific task repository that contains documents. Um, the necessary so, and supporting documents are loaded into that task repository afterward. Um, and by the time the attorney actually gets into using this task in their outlook, everything is together and assembled. So it, although it's in stages, um, by the time it's need is there, it's all assembled. Then the attorney has uh, an established connection and sync to the repository. And in this case, we use OneDrive. So the attorney has a, um, a sync to OneDrive or, or SharePoint, I guess, uh, is, is truly where the documents reside. The attorney can work on their documents from their repository sync locally. And then when they're done, they notify the paralegal. The paralegal files the action, completes the task in the docketing system, and then the process looks for completed tasks in the docketing system and completes the Outlook task in the attorney's Outlook. So all of the gray items on that flowchart are some form of automation or of eliminated human interaction. The blue items are what people do. That's a lot of time saving. An attorney doesn't have to go seek out documents to assemble for the office action they're reporting on or, or responding to and they can focus on the actual work and not have to bill somebody for assembling this themselves. <clears throat> um, and in that bundle of documents, you know, the office action is in there. There's a draft response, there's references. It's, it's a complete package for them to work from. Um, and then we just recently added a link to Foundation IP from, uh, and it's bundled in with the documents so that if the attorney wants to view the prosecution history, and this came from an attorney saying, I'd like you to create a web page that has the prosecution history. Well, going outside of what he actually wanted and thinking about the tools that we had available to us, Foundation IP is our, our source of truth and linking to that gives him the prosecution history. It also gives him an access to any other documents and it also allows him to add his billing very conveniently from one click from the, the task packet. Uh, next slide, please. And then some of these have already been discussed, but there are absolute caveats to automation and there are killers. Um, data issues have already been discussed. Dirty or incomplete data, 
it's not formatted the way you want it to be. Um, you need to find a hidden link in a, or a hi hidden data in a web link to be able to allow you to do something like we did with the foundation IP link. Um, you could have technical limitations. You, you, you're not advanced enough to do all the things that you want to do, or it's too expensive to do the auto type of automation that you're hoping for. Um, the people actually developing the automation have a poor understanding or have gotten poor communication about what needs to be done and time is wasted on creating something that wasn't exactly what the person was hoping for. Um, planning is huge. You have to take the time to plan the stuff out. You're not just planning for today, you're planning for tomorrow and what might be coming your way next time uh, or what can be built upon and to make the, the solution more robust. Um, poor execution is pretty obvious. Overthinking or overachieving, again, stacking ideas on top of each other and not just taking the quick wins and building something that's useful. Uh, underthinking or underachieving, only listening to what the person's telling you rather than seeing the big picture of how this could be useful in other areas. Um, certainly don't want to undo previous automation. We don't want to negate anything that's been done before, but maybe we can leverage the previous automation and, and again, this would be kind of an enhancement or a build from that. Um, and Steve talked about impatience. Uh, I don't know that you actually use that word, but it takes time to develop these things and it's not a race. It's, it's, it's a solution that you want to have last over time and to be able to provide value for as long as possible. So building it right and having somebody like pressure you and I need this done, I need this done, I need this done. Um, I've seen many examples throughout the years where one of our vendors might have, you know, in, uh, implemented something that was not well thought out and we suffer for it. So we try not to do that at the firm. And then the concept of perfection versus something that works. Do you wanna be 10% more efficient on this task next week? Or do you wanna be 40% more efficient a year from now, but at the same level of inefficient until then? And if I can give you small little achievements along the way that get you closer and closer to efficiency, that would be the best route to take. Plus, those things can build off of each other. If you want to wait for the perfect solution, it might not even be perfect a year from now. So being um, starting simple, building on it is, is definitely the approach that we take. Um, that was a very brief overview of how we handle automation at the firm, helping people become efficient and reducing stress has grown into a very, very rewarding part of my job. Um, I'm a creative person with an understanding of technology and it's, it, it's great to be working in a forward thinking environment. And I'm not afraid to say that when we make something that works, it's awesome and exciting and rewarding. Thank you. Hey, thank, thanks Scott and uh, kudos to Scott. Uh, he is terrific at what he does and uh, probably saves us a lot of money. And, while we're, I mean, it does save us a lot of money with everything he does. And, you know, just on that point, as we've got enough time to pontificate a little bit, um, you know, I think people talk about law firm automation, corporate department automation, you know, there, these are not things you do and move on. You don't, you don't just kind of have a project and you do it and then you're done. You're really, the future in law at, in, in every area is you you got automation specialists that are on your team. So if you're a law firm, you should have, depending on your size, um, you should have maybe at least one full-time person. If you've got even 10, 15 lawyers, you should have uh, one full-time automation person that's doing nothing but developing automation tools. If you're, you know, if you've got a, a law firm of 50, 60 attorneys, you should have four people, maybe five people, maybe six people, maybe more that are just, constantly doing these automations because they're replacing 10, 15 other people that otherwise would be sitting there doing things. They're speeding your operation up um, way faster. I mean, we've got docketing now at Schweigman comes in at four o'clock in the morning when the PTO posts it and it's in our system 
10, 15 minutes later, um, a lot of it's automatically reported um, within seconds after it gets posted. That's all things that were people sitting around doing. So, you know, and then Scott talks about, you know, the automation taking it in pieces. And it's really important to do, to break it down, to shoot, take little bites of it. I mean, I think these, you don't want to have a grandiose project, you know, we're going to do all the automation at once and we're going to build this platform that's going to take care of everything. Um, you really need to take it in bite size and you really need to build it incrementally and things keep changing so much that, you know, it's, it's like building a house and, you know, you keep tearing, you know, parts of it off that have become obsolete and building, you know, new parts to it. It's not like, it's not a pyramid. It's going to sit there forever. I mean, this stuff just constantly evolving. So it's just kind of a, a, a advice. If you want to get into automation, you need to build a team and then they take care of it for you. It's not a one-off project. So with that kind of roll into uh, to Tom and, and Ann are gonna kind of talk a little bit about what's really going on in a practical way right now with, with automation and different weird and cool stuff that uh, they're doing and Schweigman's done. Sounds good. Uh, thanks, Steve. And I'll, I, I might add to that, if, if you don't have a team, <clears throat> or trying to build a team, or you want to bring in a team, uh, you can reach out to us uh, at Black Hills because we have those teams and we can provide that as a service as well. Um, so some of the things that uh, we've done with Black Hills from uh, automation uh, perspective, uh, we're talking about uh, <clears throat> docketing, uh, all the way from manual to fully automated uh, docketing, meaning um, uh, communication pulled from the U.S. Patent Office, uh, processed, determined to determine what it is, what dates uh, are necessary to put on a docket, pushed out all the way onto a uh, firm docketing system and report outs to attorneys and paralegals kind of end to end. Uh, there's uh, a lot of interesting developments around automated uh, drafting. Um, I especially like the tool that Specifio uh, has. Um, and uh, on the machine learning front, this is where things start to get really interesting because once uh, thankfully, Black Hills has been around for a while. We've had a lot of data that we've been able to work through, lots of different documents from different patent offices, so we can start to leverage that to make uh, automation even easier, uh, to uh, ensure that we've got quality um, for even the things that aren't fully automatable. Um, so we've got projects going around monitoring uh, attorney billing for uh, firm clients, for projecting out um, expenses, uh, forecasting um, annuity fees um, uh, for review. So quality control, like I mentioned, is a, uh, um, a, a big issue. Uh, uh, and leveraging machine learning to make sure that you've got uh, things properly identified, uh, for example. Um, I think Steve, uh, SLW built a application around um, invoices, right? Yeah, so we, we um, I mean, any firm that has, a, uh, has some clients that they do a lot of work for, or even not a lot of work, knows that there are a lot of different billing coding systems. There's a lot of different billing uh, guidelines and prices set, uh, fixed fees and various different things like that, that you have to adhere to uh, carefully so that when you invoice the client, um, you know, you charge them the amount that's been agreed to and you put the appropriate codes on those uh, entries or else their systems reject it and causes them uh, pain in the neck and it's also pain in the neck for the law firm. But these, these coding systems, a lot of them are, are fairly elaborate and they're complicated. And if you only had to do one, that'd be one thing, but a law firm has to do dozens of these. And so you'll have lawyers that maybe work 
on something for a, a particular client repeatedly. And then you have other lawyers that just brought new to the team. They don't know these codes very well. They're very difficult to, to understand sometimes in terms of where things fit. So what we built was, um, you know, well, first let me say what we had before. I mean, we do have all these codes in, in our systems. So people are supposed to use them, but they often make mistakes. So we built another application that looks at all the billing entries, looks at the stage that we're at with the file um, and uh, using, you know, essentially machine intelligence and, and just old fashioned rule sets, determine if the code that is, is in that billing entry matches what we expect it to do. And if it doesn't, it corrects it automatically. Um, and then a human will review that to make sure that the system did it correctly. But instead of having people sit and look at every one of these billion entries and manually correct them for hours and hours and hours at the end of every month, we now it gets done within, you know, literally a minute once you load the data in. And then the system also looks to make sure that all of the totals for how much they add up correctly so that we've got, you know, cap you know, um, the amount of billing at the agreed upon price saves a ton of time and money it was very complicated to build that. Um, but it, you can put any clients billing codes in there now and it will work. And um, it's a UI that we built for it. So that's just an example of something that will save a lot of time at the end of the month. It will also save a lot of missed billing uh, errors that we put into customer systems. It'll be faster to get paid and better for the customer because they won't be dealing with you know our mistakes. Yeah, and you know I, I love that example because a lot of times when we start talking about automation in IP, it's well I've got to automate the core things that we do like um, off section responses, um, uh, for example, or docketing. Or but this is a great example of. Uh, that there are opportunities for automation uh, kind of in just about every aspect of firm operation. All right, let's jump to the next slide. All right, well, Tom, that's a good lead in because there are opportunities in a lot of areas for uh, uh, automation and IP legal operations right now, but the really revolutionary thing that Tom and the rest of the Black Hills team is doing is we are redefining the docketing process from a traditional manual process with the many risks associated with it to a subscription service. The process that most law firms use today is prone to error. If you think about it, the docketing staff is expected to recognize thousands of different documents from probably 160 or more different countries. On top of that, they have to know what to do with them once they recognize them and apply literally thousands of docketing rules, most of which aren't well documented. And in addition to being error prone, the process that most law firms have today is also very resource intensive. So think about what your firm has for a docketing staff. Are you using highly trained staff for repetitive low value work like transferring data between the islands of data that Tom talked about? Are you able to bill for that kind of work? If not, how much of that uh, does it cost? How much does it cost you in terms of staff time and uh, staff costs? You know, as Tom and Steve talked about converting information from, for example, patent office documents to docketing deadlines is complex. It's extremely complex, but it's a repeatable and a rule-based process that can be automated. And our passion at Black Hills is to find a better way to do this and, and other operations tasks, but particularly we've been driven by automating the, the docketing process. We standardize the information so it can be moved electronically between these systems. We automate the repeatable parts of the process. And basically the end result is a subscription service for docketing data. And I think five years from now, people will look back and, and wonder why we ever did this manually. And I compare it to the days, which many of you will remember, when you filed an application 
and you had to take the express mail packet. You know, Peter remembers the smell of the file room. I remember going to the post office at, at the Minneapolis airport at midnight with express mail packages to mail to get a filing date. But nobody does that anymore. Why? Because there's a better way to do it. We all e-file. Nobody's going to go back and take the, the express mail package to the airport just because they like they like doing it. They like seeing the guy at the post office. So the same thing's going to happen in docketing, and that's the transition that we're going to see. So, Tom, I'm going to hand it back to you. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the middleware and our middleware technology in general? Hey, before sure. You, before you jump into that, Tom, there was a question that came in, about what kind of technical background do people need to, in order to do automation? It's a great question. I just want to make sure that we have time to answer that before you kind of finish up on middleware. Um, so there's really a, a whole range of different technical uh, uh, disciplines, I guess, if you will, that we, we implement at Schweigman and I think Black Hills does the same thing to, to do automation. So we have, you know, people that are qualified uh, computer programmers that, you know, do you know, develop original code but then we have a lot of, uh, or I would say a lot, we probably have four or five people that um, basically do system configuration work. So a system like Foundation IP, um, non-programming folks can go in there that don't have any ability to program uh, on their own. They can go in and configure things. They can configure workflows and templates and, and docketing rules and stuff like that by just working inside that environment. And then also there's other tools that I know that Black Hills has that um, allow um, folks that are not programmers at all. In fact, they started out as docketers, a lot of these people, and they actually just go in and create docketing configuration rules, which help uh, set up document recognition rules and then uh, rules that connect uh, a recognized document to a pro procedure, and then they can configure how that procedure executes, all done without writing a single line of code. So um, a lot of the people that are actually coming into these careers that are in automation are just uh, a non-technical background. A lot of them, you know, are, you know, have a, maybe a, a degree in English or something, and they got into docketing, but they've got technical uh, abilities or at least the ability to configure these systems. So it's really knowing more about the, I think the being a subject matter expert is the key thing for a lot of these jobs now in automation. But you know, then you got the people that do the brand new programming and they're just traditional programmers. So go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I, I would, um, I would definitely echo that. Like the sweet spot is somebody that has a good knowledge of the IP process. Um, but is technically inclined. Uh, obviously, the the programmers like for us. And to transition into this slide, we've got folks that are building, coding up, kind of from the ground, uh, middleware solutions that work to connect uh, the data islands that we talked about uh, earlier, right? And these middleware solutions are taking something from island A, uh, manipulating it. Um, and that, that manipulation or determining what to take from the island, um, ideally that's configurable so that the, the hardcore developer doesn't have to know also, in addition to you know, their high level of understanding of software development, they don't also have to know uh, the intricacies of IP processes. It, it's helpful if they know a good amount or some of it, but ultimately you've got folks that have more of that IP process expertise, uh, say your, your automation experts that then go in and uh, configure those tools uh, that are developed. Um, so uh, these middleware products generally have administrative interfaces for those um, IP automation type folks to come and run. And uh, I, those types of tools are where, where we're working and uh, you know, where we see the, the future of this type of technology. Go to the next slide. All right, well, you know, we're seeing 
a major transition in the legal field. The rote type work is going away. For your law firm to be profitable, it'll be essential for you to use automation and AI for repeatable, rule-driven type work, especially that work that's very high volume work. So what's next in this uh, evolutionary path? Well, on the task front, the, the, the individual work front, what we're gonna see is that rule-driven, repeatable task type work will be done with automation rather than people. On the people, the staff front, what we're going to see is this will free up your talented uh, legal staff from these low value administrative tasks and allow them to do more high value tasks, ideally for a law firm to allow them to do tasks that you can actually bill your clients for and generate revenue, increase profitability. Uh, so your staff then will be transitioning from doing the rote work to supervising the systems and the tools that are doing that work. Maybe even moving into positions like the ones uh, they were describing in response to that question. That was a great question the, that uh, people are then overseeing and, and helping to develop the automation and the technology. So it's an exciting time for legal operations, particularly in the IP field. Uh, we love to help improve our customers' daily operations. I love to see success stories like the SLW uh, firm and their many, many years of commitment to automation. And I hope that this webinar gives you the inspiration to look at your own processes and start to identify areas where you can increase your efficiency with automation and technology. Thanks, Ann. And then I just, uh, before we wrap up, I wanna thank everybody for attending and then Michelle will do the closeout. But I also wanted to do a shout out to uh, Turbo Patent uh, because we have used that tool uh, quite a bit and find it very useful and we're interested in all tools. Um, as, you know, so, but that's one that we've actually got quite a bit of experience working with. And, and you know, we think those tools can help improve efficiency in drafting by, you know, if it's only even 10 or 20%, it's huge impact. So we're, we're working hard with those tools. So with that, we'll turn it over to Michelle to uh, close out the, the webinar for us. Thanks, Steve, and thank you everyone for participating. And we have more presentations coming up as part of the Destination IP Virtual Summit for the rest of the week. And we would love to see you back. Um, thank you for joining us and be well.